Dr. Ian Grelnick joins me now talking about ASGE Symposium on Quality in Colonoscopy. Clearly something that every physician strives for, but there are certain parameters that really need to be met. Yeah, absolutely. So, first of all, we know that colonoscopy itself is life-saving procedure, right? It's the best test we have for looking for really the precursors of colon cancer, right? We're not really looking for colon cancer, we're looking for the precursors or adenomatous polyps and we want to take those out. So we've developed now quality indicators as to what makes for a good colonoscopy, okay? Specifically for the screening patient population. And one of those is the number of adenomas that you find. Exactly, so there's something called the adenoma detection rate, or the ADR, which really defined is, is if you find at least one polyp, right? So there's some people who are now advocating even something called ADR plus, because maybe just finding one is enough. There's something, there's actually a situation where they call one and done, where maybe providers find one adenoma. And they feel, well, I found my one adenoma, and maybe I don't need to be as meticulous in the rest of my exam, which we know you do need to be as meticulous, and that maybe we should be reporting something more. So if we find even two or more adenomas to keep people really focused. So it's very important. And that concept of looking for more also encompasses the withdrawal time, the time that you're spending on this scan. A absolutely. So let me just, withdrawal time is part of it, but what, what ADR really does is we know that there are benchmarks of what myself as a colonoscopist I should be striving for. So in male patients, I need to find, have an adenoma detection rate of at least 30% in my examinations. For women, the benchmark is currently at least 20% right? So we know what that is. We also know that there's very good data that the higher an individual's ADR is as a provider, as a colonoscopist, the, the better we are at preventing cancer. Because there is an entity called post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer or interval colorectal cancer, which means that somebody's had a colonoscopy, but they come back with a colorectal cancer before the next scheduled surveillance period and we want to try to decrease that. We know that that occurs probably anywhere from about three to seven percent overall. So it's, it's not high, but it's not zero either. And the higher the detection rate, the lower that rate is going that's, to be. That's what we believe. So there are, you, you mentioned withdrawal time. So there are a number of other quality parameters for colonoscopy. Withdrawal time is one of those, meaning that we, know, we also know that there are data that we look for our polyps on withdrawal and we want to know that we're at least spending enough time to get the best visualization possible of, of the colon. So at least a minimum of six minutes of withdrawing the colonoscope. There's even some data that shows if we take a little bit longer, we may even improve our adenoma detection rate. And then there also is the idea of, of getting to the end of the colon. Correct. So that's another quality indicator, which is the cecal intubation rate. And we know that colonoscopists, we should be getting to the cecum at least 90% of the time during our examinations. It's very important. And just saying that you get to the cecum is no longer adequate. In other words, that data point is, or that indicator is potentially corruptible. What do I mean? Is that it's inadequate for me today on my colonoscopy reports to just say, I got to the cecum. You need to photo document that you got to the cecum and leave that photo document as part of the uh, documentation of the patient's medical record. So percentages and time people need to know about, but also bowel prep can really have an impact on the efficacy of this thing. Huge impact, and we're learning more about that. Um, we know that there are now, first of all, there are validated scales that are out there that allow me as the colonoscopist to put a number as to or a grade as to how poor or how good the bowel preparation was. The most common one and the most well validated scale today is the bowel, uh, the Boston bowel preparation score. Okay, there's also something called the Aronchik score, but the Boston bowel prep score is the most validated and most uh, widely uh, used. And uh, we know that the better the bowel prep, the more we see, the higher the adenoma detection rate. And those have changed, some of the bowel prep procedures. They have. Uh, really what is now evidence-based is that we as providers should be having our patients receive what's called split prep dosing of their bowel prep. So that means that they don't just take it at one time the night before their colonoscopy, 
depending on when their colonoscopy is scheduled, whether it's in the morning or for sure when it's in the next afternoon, we want to split that prep. Generally what I do in, in my practice, if somebody's coming in in the morning, I will give them a, their half of their bowel prep somewhere around maybe 6 p.m. in the evening, and then I will have them take the second prep somewhere very late at night, okay? Some patients you have to convince that this is really important, but, but you want to be able to give them that last dose about six hours before they come for their scheduled examination, but you wanna make sure they finish that prep two hours, two to three hours before so their stomach is empty by the time they come for the procedure. Afternoon procedures, you wanna be able to do the same thing. You wanna give them, you even can give it all in the morning, or you can split it and give it the night before and in the morning. Critical information, but clearly it's going to help increase the quality of the colonoscopy. We, we, we think so, and it, it's very important. There's also data to show that we can probably be a little bit more liberal with what we're allowing patients to eat before they have their colonoscopy. In the past, we've always told them, you really just need to be on clear liquids. Patients don't like that. I mean, they're hungry and, and, and compliance, right, is a problem. So how can we improve compliance? We now have data that shows that even if you allow patients to have a low residue diet, right, up to even lunchtime or dinner the day before their exam, they still have a good prep if you give them a split prep, and they're going to be more compliant, and they're going to be happier about what they're doing. And it's all about happiness. Then it's a win-win situation. Absolutely. Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.